you shouldn't be having high blood pressure and cardiovascular issues until you're in your 40s at least. But these are children, for heaven's sake. So that's why I say we are all candidates for atherosclerosis, depending on how you choose to eat, your diet, and how you choose to live. Cue music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. I've brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. Thank you for joining us here on the Autoimmune Hour with Sharon Saylor. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio. Join the Autoimmune Hour's Courage Club. Sign up now at understandingautoimmune.com. Now, back to your host, Sharon Saylor. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com and from UnderstandingAutoimmune.com, where you can find over 400-plus episodes of our show. And tonight, believe it or not, after 400-plus episodes, we haven't really devoted anything to this topic, and it's a biggie. Let me introduce our guest tonight, because we're going to be talking about our hearts, heart disease, and high cholesterol. And Dr. Michael Garko is a credentialed and practicing nutritionist. He earned an accredited master's degree in human nutrition from the University of Bridgeport. Dr. Garko also produced and hosted a popular health talk radio show called Let's Talk Nutrition, which aired for two hours a day, five days a week. Wow, I get tired just thinking about that because I only produce one show a week. He believes that nutrition is the driving force in our health. And so welcome, Dr. Garko. Thanks for being on the show. I think it's so easy to overlook our cardiovascular system until it's too late. Sharon, thank you so much for the opportunity to come on to your show. It's a privilege. And this, all this business about cholesterol and heart attacks, heart disease, it gets real confusing for people. Instinctively and naturally, people understand the importance of their cardiovascular system. They know that if something goes wrong, you can either have a heart attack or stroke. For many people, that's about as far as their understanding of the cardiovascular system goes. I think it's important to situate this whole cholesterol issue uh, in context. And I think the context here is to point out why your cardiovascular system is so important and why you need to take care of it. It turns out you're going to find some interesting things here that will, it certainly got my attention, notwithstanding my decades of training, it still got my attention. And I'll share that. To know this, your cardiovascular system transports nutrients, gases, waste products around your body has to do that. It protects your body from infection and blood loss. It will help the body maintain a constant temperature. That's called thermoregulation. And it helps maintain fluid balance within the body. Those are very important functions. And whether you have heart disease or not, high blood pressure or not, those systems, those functions have to be maintained. And if an illness should befall you, your cardiovascular system is going to have to really be working to do all of those functions that I said to maintain your ability to battle with whatever the disease may be, cancer or whatever. So that's important. So you might have people watching today that will say, look, I don't have high cholesterol. My triglycerides are good. My blood pressure is great. And I don't have cardiovascular disease of any kind. That may be true at the moment. If you live long enough, aging being what it is and biology being what it is, there will come a time when you will have 
most likely issues to deal with, whether it's high blood pressure or not. It could be any number of things. So it's important to do two things here, prevention and preparation. It's a preparation. Prevention, obvious, right? You're trying to prevent something bad from happening. Let's say, I use a metaphor, we can prevent a war. We can do that. And we do that all the time in our country. We're trying to prevent wars. But are you prepared to fight that war? You can prevent an illness. And you may do certain things that are very focused on that one thing. But are you prepared to get sick with some very serious disease process like cancer, I mentioned? or have a serious heart attack, are you prepared to fight that battle? I think we all know a lot of the proper steps, like sleep, get good sleep, proper diet, all all sorts of things. Define what you mean by prepared, because I'm thinking if I'm exercising like they say, if I'm eating like they say, um, and I'm reducing my stress like they say, isn't that me preparing? It depends. To what extent are you doing that? Oh, and how much am I cheating? <laughs> and how well are you doing that? Are you building, let's say you want to prevent some particular disease process from happening. And so you're singularly focused on that. Okay. But are you prepared for any other cut, an accident where you're in a serious car accident and you're now fighting for your life? Have you built up enough? inventory of prevention doesn't necessarily, you can't assume that it's going to lead to the person building up a really an abundant inventory of health to be able to cope with the stress of getting sick or dealing with a serious disease. Prevention that, you know, like I said, you can prevent a war, but once you're in the war, are you prepared to engage that battle on a sustained basis. I think with an autoimmune condition, though, a lot of us are already in the battle. And a lot of our resources could be depleted fighting things such as inflammation, which I know can lead to heart disease or heart irritation. And we're we're already in the battle depleting our resources. In my mind, if you've got a diagnosis, and oftentimes right. people with autoimmune have more than one diagnosis, which is really unfortunate. This is true. Of course, arthritis is an autoimmune disease. We have many digestive disorders that are autoimmune related and so on. Let's say that somebody was focused on, their, they had some sort of digestive disorder was autoimmune related, and they focused on that. And they were trying to prevent that from happening. Were they thinking about their cardiovascular system? No, probably not. Probably not. Were they thinking about their neurological system? Were they thinking, hopefully, about their immune system? Because that's at the key here of autoimmune. And so you get my point. I think our heart is like breathing. We've always had it. It has always done its job. And until it begins to break down... I don't know. I guess in my mind, we don't put it in the urgent category. We're out putting out fires, maybe other places like our digestive system or our poor diet or cheating. (laughs) Oh, one cookie won't hurt diet. Too often we overlook our heart and just like breathing. It's always been there. It's always worked. Remember what I said, your cardiovascular system and that your heart is only as big as a fist. If you go make a fist like this, that's it. It's not very big and it's going to pump and average on average, it expands and contracts about a hundred thousand times a day. It's going to pump about 2000 gallons of blood through your system. And when you take your arterial network, your vascular network, not just arterial, but when you take the veins, the capillaries, the arterials, the whole vascular system and string it together. It's 60,000 miles in length. What? That's twice around the planet. And it turns out that the heart and the vascular system 
doesn't do a real good job of self-repair. It just doesn't. When you have a heart attack and blood is cut off to a certain portion of the heart, necrosis, killing of the tissue, the cells, happens right away. That's why it's critical to get the person to a hospital if they have a stroke and the blood is cut off to the brain, every minute counts with a stroke. So a lot of things can go wrong in that vast network of that vascular system. And again, the heart and the vascular system, when you have atherosclerosis and the arteries that have a lot of plaque in them, calcified plaque, cannot get rid of calcified plaque. You can rid the body of soft fatty plaque, but calcified plaque, it's like stone, right? Metaphorically. So you're stuck with it. And now you got to either do bypass or other things that they have to make your heart function better. And so you can get oxygen and nutrients to every cell in your body. So that's why I'm saying that even if you're healthy at this moment, you have to think in the moment, but you have to think ahead a little bit and say, okay, if I don't die of a disease process, it's going to be an accident. One or the other is going to take us out and we're going to leave this good earth. So assume that you can live, you want to live a long life with quality of life. I can assure you, you're going to have a hell of a time doing that with a compromised cardiovascular system because if the cells, tissues, and organs cannot receive at least oxygen and the nutrients, never mind all the other functions to rid the body of all the waste material and toxins, to help fight infections with all the different kinds of blood cells. You're going to have a very difficult time. That's why you see people who are struggling with, let's say, an autoimmune disease or cancer, and they're having that disease unto itself is difficult. But if they have high blood pressure, or their heart is weak, it drives the doctors crazy because now the patient is so compromised. It, it, it can't, the patient can't engage that battle as robustly, but because that cardiovascular system is just not working efficiently to get the nutrients and the oxygen to the cells. The body can heal itself, but it doesn't do that out of the ether. It needs material to do that, oxygen and nutrients and whatever else we're feeding it to help with repair. That's why I think the cardiovascular system has to be part of prevention and part of preparation down the road. Um, You've terrified me there, Dr. Cargo. <laughs> so right now I'm feeling like, let's get into some tips into this. Okay, so I am not in that stage yet. We'll just set the stage like Maybe I'm not in, my heart's doing okay. I'm not in that stage yet. What are some of the preventative slash preparation things that we should be doing? Ah. So we can understand, okay, I'm not there yet. And you've terrified me enough. I don't want to get there. Okay. And something to keep in mind here, little principles. You're only as healthy and old as your arteries. Think about that. So keep that in the back of your mind. I was going to say you're only as old as you feel, but yours is much more. Yes, I get the point. You're only as old as, you, as your arteries. You're only as healthy and old as your arteries are. And before I get to those tips, I'll, let me share this. I think this is really important to know. As a species, and I'm not making this up. I'm a medical researcher. So when I come on air and do things like this, what I'm saying is you can vet me, vet what I'm saying. You'll find it in the literature. We as a species are prone to heart attacks and coronary artery disease caused by atherosclerosis, which is placking of the arteries. So anything that I talk about in terms of, of prevention and preparation, I target that that process, atherosclerosis. The research really is robust and it shows that we are all, every one of us, you, me, and all the people we care about and love at a risk for atherosclerosis, which can cause a heart attack and strokes. Make no mistake, 
atherosclerosis is a stealth-like lethal cardiovascular-related killer. Heart disease in the form of coronary artery disease caused by atherosclerosis is a serial killer. It is the leading cause of death in this country and around the world. It's been stalking humankind for thousands, if not millions of years. Yes, I said millions. How do I know that? The science of paleogenetics tells us that our ancient ancestors had atherosclerosis. But wait a minute. Those guys would be pretty active trying just to survive. I've always thought it was my lackadaisical enforcement of exercise and my easy diet. Okay. That's true. A sedentary lifestyle, a cardiogenic diet made up of salt, sugar, and fat loaded with saturated fat, salt, and sugar, um, alcohol, not enough sleep, too much stress, all contribute. Those are all risk factors for atherosclerosis. That's bad news, but there's worse news. Well, you're just a bundle of good news today, Dr. Well, I will have some good news. There's hope. Oh, okay. <laughs> so what we've learned from the science, from anthropologists and paleontologists and the science of paleogenetics, about two or three million years ago, our ancient ancestors had a heightened risk of cardiovascular disease because of a single gene mutation that occurred. And it also set us up for the risk of eating a lot of red meat, which is high in saturated fat, with the loss of a single gene. So we have some evidence for this. I'm not making it up. There was a body that they found about, oh, how long ago was that? He lived, I guess it was 5,000 years ago, whatever. Is they called him Utsi, Utsi the Iceman. They found him in the Alps. He was very well preserved. He lived around 3,300 BC, somewhere in there. And they estimate his age to be 40 to 50 years of age. He was well preserved because he was in the ice. He came from a culture called the Tuurulian culture. And it's, it was interesting up in the Alps, they find him and they discovered that he had atherosclerosis. They also have looked at the mummified bodies of the Egyptian kings, and they have found that they also had calcified patches on their arteries indicative of advanced atherosclerosis. There wasn't all these fast food restaurants. They didn't have alcohol. Maybe the Egyptians did, but Utsi certainly didn't. So what was, the, what was that? How did that happen? It was a predisposition, this genetic predisposition that we have to get atherosclerosis. Now, that, it's not necessarily dominating. It doesn't have to express, but the way you live, the way you eat can contribute if you, you don't do it in a good way. So what I'm saying to you is that when we started, I said it's a sooner or later, we usually have some sort of cardiovascular condition that we have to deal with. We are all at risk for atherosclerosis, and that's the disease that causes heart attacks and strokes. All races, you name it, gender, age, it makes no difference. And that's my position, and, I, and that's based upon the data set that is robust to support that argument, that claim. What can we do then? Because this is pretty terrifying. I want to jump into the, the, the cup half full side here. What can we do? I know that I fake myself out a lot thinking that I'm eating a really great diet, but I'm probably not. I'm probably, as you said, too much salt, too much sugar. And let's talk a little bit and um, just go through some of the things that we can least prolong or that moment when we have to deal with it. We want to forestall yes. as we went to delay. You don't want to just live a long life. You want to live a long life with quality of life. Just keep this in mind too. Our ancient ancestors lived with a lot of stress and scarcity. We live with a lot of stress, abundance, and convenience. 
that has turned us as a species into a dumpster fire. Oh, yep. <laughs> Think about it. Stress, abundance, and abundance of these cardiogenic foods, these processed foods, and convenience. We're not as active. Our ancient ancestors had to be on the move. There was no sitting around. They had to keep moving. We should keep moving. So exercise and being physically active is one way to keep your cardiovascular system healthy. Diet is the centerpiece of everything. I believe that nutrition is the driving force of our health, wellness, and well-being. From a diet perspective, you want to eat a diet that's primarily, but not necessarily exclusively, plant-based. We know from looking at different cultures around the world, those societies and cultures where it's more plant-based, where they're eating fruits, vegetables, seeds, legumes, nuts, and so on, all plant-based, live longer and have better quality of life and less chronic diseases. Those cultures where it's a meat-eating culture, Mongolia, that is a pastoral society. They eat a lot of cattle, a lot of meat. You take, go do a little Google search on the health and wellness of people in Mongolia. It is abysmal. So a diet that's more plant-based, one diet, the Mediterranean diet, when I use the word diet, I don't mean weight loss. When I say weight loss diet, that's what I'm talking about. Here, diet means what you eat every day. That Mediterranean diet, there are thousands of studies on the Mediterranean diet. The other good diet is what's called the DASH diet, dietary approaches to stop hypertension. I know it says hypertension, dietary approaches to stop hypertension, but it turns out that it has. It's very similar to the Mediterranean diet. Now, I was raised on a Mediterranean diet because my parents were immigrants, and that's what was served, and that's what my mother cooked. That's how she taught me to cook, too. That's, and that's what I've eaten my whole life. So that diet is rich in fruits and vegetables, rich in, in fish, omega-3s, minimal amount of red meat. When you eat a Mediterranean diet, in our culture, when we put meat on the plate is as big as a hot cap on a 55 Buick, first of all. And the meat dominates the whole plate. And then you've got this little green stuff around. It looks just like decoration. With a Mediterranean diet, it's just the opposite. The plate is in abundance with vegetables and of all different colors. And there may be a portion of meat, red meat or some other kind of meat or fish, but it's not you know, a huge piece. We have... A there are so many things I can share with you. We have what we call blue zones. David Butner did some research. He went around the world and found all these places where people lived longer and had great quality of life. Okinawa was one of them. There's a place in Italy. There's a Sardinia. There's a place in Greece. But there's a place in California. Of all places, right? It's the only place in the United States that's a blue zone. And it's in Loma Linda, California. So what if you had to hazard a guess? What do you think is going on in Loma Linda that causes generally the people there to be living longer with better quality of life? You have a guess? From the same ancestors? I don't know. I'm thinking maybe they're all from the same You're close. region. You're close. They all belong to the same religion. Well, okay. The people, the seventh, seven the seventh Adventists. They are vegans and vegetarians. And it's interesting how nutrition gets implicated with religion. I'm not advocating for Seventh-day Adventists. I'm just saying that because of their religious practices, they eat a certain way, which has caused them to have great quality of life and less disease, as they do in Okinawa, as they do in Sardinia, as they do in that little isle in Greece and other places around the world. So there's evidence to show that a diet that's more plant-based, and the Mediterranean is not just a diet, it's a lifestyle. If you go you travel to Italy or that Mediterranean basis, Spain, Italy, Greece, and see the way the people live, it's a different lifestyle. So it's a lifestyle of 
man, and it's not as frenetic and stressful with sleep and rest. Uh, in Italy, they shut things down at one o'clock. You can't do much until around five o'clock. Everything shuts down. You have to wait. <laughs> and then you end up eating dinner at eight o'clock or nine o'clock. I've spent my share of time there. And so it's lifestyle, diet and lifestyle. Diet is, the lifestyle includes everything. And having good relationships, good social network, being peaceful, learning how to manage stress, uh, which is critical. Stress is a killer. So it's a combination of things. And it turns out when you violate the diet and the lifestyle in the way that I'm suggesting, atherosclerosis happens. And I can tell you this, we have children, eight, nine, 10 years old on high blood pressure meds and cholesterol medications that have the beginning stages of atherosclerosis. When you look at their arteries and the intimal lining of the artery, that intimal layer, you can start to see what they call fatty streaks. This is already the beginning of placking. These are in children. Wow. These heart disease related conditions are adult diseases. And now they're befalling children. Why? Because there's an obesity epidemic among children. And in the way they're living, they're sedentary and they're eating a diet that is so unhealthy. And, it, and they're becoming obese. 25% of youngsters, adolescents are overweight or obese. And it's just a dreadful thing that's happening. By the time they're 20, they got so many health issues. You shouldn't be having high blood pressure and cardiovascular issues until you're in your 40s at least. But these are children, for heaven's sake. So that's why I say we are all candidates for atherosclerosis, depending on how you choose to eat your diet and how you choose to live. Wow. We need to take a quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to talk to Dr. Michael Garko some more about our heart and how to live healthy and long and successfully. So we'll be right back. The Autoimmune Hour will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by understandingautoimmune.com to learn more. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Hi, it's Olivia Munn with my shelter pets, Frankie and Chance. Say hi, guys. <coughs> when I adopted them, I discovered that they both have incredible personalities. Chance's sole purpose in life is to love and to be loved. Frankie is a little bit of a scoundrel and always entertaining. <coughs> They're a little bit of a lot of things, but they're all pure love. Adopt pure love at theshelterpetproject.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council, the Humane Society of the United States, and Maddie's Fund. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Listen and imagine. It takes five seconds to send a text, and for those five seconds, you're driving blind. Life is worth more than a text. Stay alive. Don't text and drive. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Sharon, and of course you know me from here on the Autoimmune Hour. Maybe you don't know I'm also an author. My latest book is for kids. It's Pinky Chenille and the Rainbow Hunters, a winner of a five-star reader's favorite review. It's perfect for your early reader and a great bedtime story for your young adventurers. Check it out over at PinkyChenille.com. That's P-I-N-K-Y-C-H-E-N-I-L-L-E dot com. See you there. Research shows we apologize up to 10 times a day, and most of the time... 
We say sorry as a response to someone else's mistake. What if we thanked people instead of all that unnecessary apologizing? So instead of saying, sorry, I'm rambling, you say, thank you for listening. Join us at projectforgive.com, a free non-religious resource on global forgiveness. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And be sure and go over to understandingautoimmune.com to find all the previous episodes on just a plethora of topics. And tonight, believe it or not, this is a topic we really haven't given much energy to. And after our first part here with Dr. Michael Garko, I can absolutely see where I was remiss in not bringing this very important topic up of our heart. and living along in our vascular system. Uh, Dr. Garka, one of the things that is very common in people with autoimmune condition, I don't know the exact statistics, I'm going to say probably most people, have a lot of inflammation. How does the heart disease and things play into either creating the inflammation or keeping it going? When you read the literature, the, the scientific literature, medical literature, atherosclerosis, which is the disease mechanism of action for heart disease, is an inflammatory disease, as it turns out. It creates inflammation because the, when you damage the arteries, when you have too much cholesterol, and that cholesterol gets oxidized and yet gets stuck in that artery, in that intimal layer, and starts to build up, and then you get foam cells. It's a very complicated process. I could walk you through the steps, but we put everybody to sleep. Five or six steps. It takes time. It takes decades for this to happen. And that inflammation, because that artery is damaged, infection and injury do what? They trigger the immune system to do what? Create inflammation. It's paradoxical. Inflammation is intended to help heal and repair. But when it gets out of control, it does the opposite. So it's one of the paradoxes. So atherosclerosis, which is this ongoing damage to the arteries, is an inflammatory disease, but it's inherently that. And so heart disease is an inflammatory disease. Autoimmune diseases are inspired by the hallmark symptom or sign is inflammation. That's the hallmark of autoimmune diseases. It's also the hallmark of heart disease. And when your LDL cholesterol is too high, when your HDL is too low, when you have diabetes, you smoke, you're obese, you're physically inactive, you have high, high levels of C-reactive protein, which we can measure, which is a measurement of inflammation. We have a lot of inflammation through the system. You are now prone for heart disease. There is this very intricate and interesting connection between inflammation, heart disease, autoimmunity. Autoimmunity is a inflammatory a hallmark is inflammation. All autoimmune disease, it's about inflammation. Inflammation is our friend up to a point when the immune system goes haywire. And as we age, it can do that. It's a very sensitive system it can get us into a lot of trouble. Some people are born with SNPs, these single nucleotide polymorphisms, these genetic mutations, where they inherently have this kind of thing happen and they have a lot of inflammation. I've always argued that in order to age successfully, if you can keep systemic inflammation, keep it down and try to moderate it and manage it, you will age more successfully. I've always believed that. All chronic diseases, have the word inflammation involved with them because they're an, they cause injury, injury and infection, injury and infection, in, immune, injury, infection, inflammation. They're all I words and they all go together. When I was diagnosed with the, my autoimmune condition, as well as other things, I can look back through my medical history in my mind and see the progression to the big diagnosis. Why is inflammation at least in my experience, inflammation was rarely talked about in that progression towards that final diagnosis. They were treating surface things. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't in a, no one ever sounds to me like got to the real juice of the thing. And that's 
you got inflammation, girl. And how do you calm that down? It turns out that from a nutritional standpoint, I have a nutrition practice called Neutrologic Health and Wellness. And I have clients with autoimmune disorders, digestive disorders that create all kinds of inflammation, cardiovascular issues. I'm dealing with inflammation every single day. And so we know now there are medications to do that, but they have side effects. Sometimes as a last ditch effort, you got to do it. You just got to give the patient because they don't want to do anything else. They're not going to do what you ask them to do. So the doctor, as a last resort, says, you got to take these drugs to calm down, cool down the body, with, not without consequence. But there are botanicals that will do that as well. Curcumin, for example, is a great anti-inflammatory. Vitamin E is an anti-inflammatory. Aged garlic extract. That's one of my favorite compounds. Not just garlic, but garlic that has been aged. And interesting thing here, Sharon, is that when we age garlic, this is one of the rare instances where science and technology is able to improve on nature. When we age the garlic, and preferably organic garlic, there are botanicals that will help fight inflammation and will serve you well and make your cardiovascular system work better so you can deal with your digestive disorders or your autoimmune disorder. Aged garlic extract, what it does do, you have to, if you're on a blood thinner, you need to talk with your cardiologist because, and you should not be taking omega-3 fatty acids either, fish oil at high doses if you're on a blood thinner because that thins the blood. Vitamin E thins the blood. All of these will help fight inflammation. But if you're taking a blood thinner, you may thin out the blood too much. So you, need to, you do need to talk to a cardiologist. We just have about 10 minutes left. We've talked about diet. We've talked about some supplements. Let's talk about the other one that I think people resist the most, or they say, I went for a five-minute walk, so I'm exercising. Let's talk about the importance of exercise. Okay. So I have a, I'm biased here. I work out and train six days a week. I've done that for years for two hours, an hour and a half minimum, two hours on the outside if I have my training partner with me. When I do that six days a week, when I get off the air here with you, I'll be headed off to the gym. And people say, you devote that much time. Yes, I do. Uh, it's both resistance training, which is like lifting weights, and cardiorespiratory training, walking, running, uh, biking, those kinds of things, even dancing. I've done that since I, I've been a boy. I've always, for whatever reason, have been physically active. We did not evolve to be sedentary. Think about how much time we sit. If you drive to work, you got a 45 minute, maybe an hour commute. You got, and then you got that coming home. Now you're sitting at work for eight hours. So already you probably have spent out of that 10 hours, probably eight of it sitting down. You come home, you eat dinner, and then you sit on a sofa. You spent most of the day in a sedentary modality. And you do that day in and day out, year in and year out. I can tell you, you cannot bargain with biology and evolution. You can't. It will catch up to you and you will suffer the consequences. We were made to move. Our ancient ancestors were constantly on the move. They had to be. They had to go find food, hunt and gather, hunt, whatever they had to do to survive. So I remember what I said. Our ancient ancestors, scarcity and stress, we don't have scarcity. We have abundance, stress, and convenience. We have people, I call them frontline parkers. They will park that car at the closest to the door at the mall. I park mine way out in the hinterlands and walk in. So we look for all kinds of ways not to keep moving. It has not served us well in our quest to be healthy. And I'll repeat it again. You cannot bargain with biology. It's only a matter of time. With autoimmune, oftentimes we've lost the original bargain and we're in a process of rebargaining, to use your metaphor. I know at the height of my diagnosis, my legs weren't working enough to probably walk more than across the room. And it's been a process to regain that mobility. What are some tips that you have for people who are like, I would love to be able to do two hours in the gym again, but I'm not there. I'm starting at just above zero. To your point, maybe if 
somebody who would have coached you and got you to a place where you were preparing for that event, that autoimmune event that you talk about with me here now. Yes. And your legs were stronger and you would have been doing exercises with weights and other things to strengthen the legs. You would have had a maybe an easier time. That's what I meant by preparation. That's a wonderful example. Uh, you didn't foresee that, oh, one day, and most people don't. One day they wake up and boom goes the dynamite. As the autoimmune hour here, most of us are already there. What do I do to regroup, shall I say? I would start with walking. Uh, I had a client who was so sick, I managed to convince him, if you can walk to the mailbox. We started with that. And now he's doing 10,000 steps a day. It took a year, mm -hmm. but I got him there and was just walking. Now he's interested in wanting to go to the gym. Now he's, it's, it's a progression. So I would start with walking. You don't have to be walking to, you can't, you know, can't catch your breath. Just keep moving. Don't sit for long periods of time. Stand up and walk around. Sometimes we, they even have standing desks now. I'm the, that's mixed, but they say sitting's the new smoking. To some degree, that may be true. So anything you can do to fight being sedentary. And if I would take if with a client, if I can get that client even to walk around the block to start with, that's a good start. Because I'm one that works from a desk a lot. And if I don't set a timer, I can often get too engrossed in my work that yeah. all will happen. Oh my gosh, three hours have gone by. I didn't even know yeah. that. So I like to set a little timer. Yeah. That just reminds me to get up, move around, go get some water. They even have exercise bands rubber bands at different strengths you can have them right there around the house and you open them if you go on youtube all kinds of videos there on how to use exercise bands if you don't want to go to a gym you can have even maybe a few weights at home not real heavy weights and again youtube is very can be very instructive and you can see very for at different ages you'll find it there it's there but the exercise bands, I see people, they even use them in the gym. Now, I'm in a gym where there's a lot of professional athletes and whatnot. That's a whole different world. And I don't expect my clients to do that. But if I can get them to walk, go to the mall. Go shopping, man. Don't shop online. Go to the mall and walk through the mall. Low impact. If you can ride a bike or a stationary bike, that's good. There are all kinds of things that you can do to keep moving. Now, we're just down to the last six minutes, so I want to have a little bit of time to talk about, we haven't really got into cholesterol. Let's talk about cholesterol a bit from, first off, I've heard people say, oh yes, I have bad numbers, but it's genetic. How much of cholesterol is genetic versus just poor lifestyle choices? Most of the variants for High cholesterol contributing to atherosclerosis is diet and lifestyle. It's accounted for by diet and lifestyle. There is a certain percentage of the population. I don't know off the top of my head what exactly that is that will have a predisposition. Uh, look, family history is a risk factor. I had a neighbor. He had three brothers. And he, uh, all three of his brothers died of atherosclerosis, heart disease, and so did he. So it was genetic. His, his liver was making too much cholesterol. Cholesterol is not demonic. We need cholesterol. Isn't it brain food? I've heard that it helps feed the brain. Oh, it, it, it does many things. It, it helps in the production of hormones. It helps in your cell membranes. You need to have cholesterol as part of that architecture. It serves many good purposes but it, not at these high levels. So cholesterol is really a story of a, too much of a good thing. I'm not here to demonize cholesterol, but having too much cholesterol in the system is a well-established risk factor for heart disease and heart attacks caused by atherosclerosis. By the way, having too little cholesterol in the system accelerates aging, and contributes to aging-related diseases, primarily aging of the skin. So it's you got to have it at the right levels. Running high cholesterol levels 
people say, oh, that's all a myth. It's a conspiracy between the doctors and the drug companies. And I always ask, where do they hold that annual meeting? Is it somewhere in the Alps in a bunker? What are you talking about? What conspiracy are you talking about? High cholesterol, high cholesterol, off the chain cholesterol is the culprit. And so you want to avoid a diet that's high in saturated fat. These processed foods, high in saturated fat, sugar, and salt contribute to atherosclerosis and saturated fat contributes to the production of cholesterol. Your body makes it. Now, you, can't, you shouldn't eliminate it from your diet, but you should eat foods that are less inclined to be loaded with cholesterol. We're down to just the last three minutes. Please tell us more about your work and how people can get a hold of you. Our show is just too short here to get all my questions in. Sure. I'm on all the social media platforms. I'm on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok. I'm there. And you can find me there. It's Dr. Michael Garko. Sometimes my name will be Dr. and Michael together, and then last Garko separated. But you type in my name, you'll find me. I'm everywhere to be found. And I have my own nutrition practice, Neutrologic Health and Wellness. You can find me there. This business about health, wellness, and well-being, I'm really a privilege to be on your show to talk about these things. I'll share this with you. I'm 79 years old, so I don't just come on here and talk about this stuff. I live it, and I try to be a good example for my clients and for all the people that I come in contact with on a show like yours. It's one thing to say things. It's another thing to be able to be a good example. I try my best. I'm not without my own nutritional sin. <laughs> we all commit it. I do my best to live a healthy life. And I always try to leave with a, a, a sort of a spiritual, inspirational thought. And what I can tell you is I've learned through my own challenges and having at one point to fight for my life, I've learned to live one day at a time, mindfully, in the moment, with purpose, passion, and gratitude, all in the better service of others. I find that that mantra keeps me centered and balanced. And that is part of health and wellness too. And the other thought I can have, share with you is, and my dad told me as a boy, he would say to me, Michael, your health is your wealth. And as I got older and got into my profession and did my own show, I realized your health is your wealth and your health is the wealth of those people that care about and love you. So if something should befall you, it's also a consequence for them as well. So if you won't do it for yourself, do it for all those people that love and care about you. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Michael Garko. I'm going to spell your last name. It's G-A-R-K-O, just like it sounds, Garko. You yep. can find him on all the social media places. And thank you so much for being on the show. Really appreciate your insights. And a little bit of scare tactics never hurts anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but the message is that I'll quote Bertrand Russell. He's the philosopher. He said, I would rather be mad with the truth, meaning insane than sane with lies, close quote. And so I follow that principle too. Absolutely. We did come up with some great ways to overcome some of that scary news that we offered up front. So everyone, have a great week, whatever your adventures. Join me next week for another brand new episode. Go over to understandingautoimmune.com or find us on the social media. It's always Understanding Autoimmune or there's some old legacy sites that are called Autoimmune Hour, which is the show you're listening to right now. Have a great day. See you soon. Enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites, and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes. For the next few minutes, we'll be providing a guided meditation. Meditation is a positive way to help reset your day and does require specific, targeted attention and focus. Please do not drive or operate machinery during this time. As we say here, drive when you drive and meditate when you meditate.
take a nice deep breath and extend your exhale. On the next deep breath, let it out with a sigh. <sighs> That's right. Find a nice comfy position. Wiggle about, get all the nooks and crannies comfy. Shake your fingers and wiggle your toes. And from this comfy position, go to your favorite spot. You know the place. Maybe it's real, or maybe it's only in your mind. As you continue to breathe deep and extend your exhale, Savor the colors, the smells, the textures and patterns. Breathing deep. You know the spot. You've been here many times before. Take a moment. And do you notice anything different? Something you haven't seen before? Something that's changed? Something that's new? Something that's gone? That's right. As you continue to breathe deep and extend your exhale, just notice all that changes in your favorite spot. And yet it's still familiar, still comfortable, still your favorite spot. That's right, continue to breathe deep as you get comfortable with change. That's right. Are things continuing to change in your spot? Maybe the wind is blowing about. Colors are dancing. The smells are changing. Breathe into it, relax into it. Getting comfortable with change, noticing it's as natural as your breath. Hmm, that's right. Taking all that you've learned about getting comfortable with change as natural as your breath. Gathering up all that you've learned, all that you've thought about with appreciation and gratitude. Bring it back to the present moment with your next breath. Alert, eyes wide open, alive and ready to begin your day again. That's right. <sighs> Welcome back. Research shows we apologize up to 10 times a day, and most of the time, we say sorry as a response to someone else's mistake. What if we thanked people instead of all that unnecessary apologizing? So instead of saying, sorry, I'm rambling, 
you say thank you for listening. Join us at ProjectForgive.com, a free non-religious resource on global forgiveness. Do you want to be a better leader, have better relationships, become more self-aware, be a better communicator? Hi, I'm Sharon Saylor, best-selling author, professional speaker, and executive coach. And my life passion is empowering professionals to be the best that they can be. After years of working with professionals, I've discovered the seven things nobody is telling you that can cost you your clients, sales, and even your career. And I want to give it to you free. You've heard my show. You know my passion. And maybe we'll be working together sooner rather than later. So go grab this ebook now to find out the seven things that's costing you big time over at SharonSailor.com forward slash radio gift. Hey, hon, what you doing with your phone? Taking pictures? No. I'm asking it questions. Like what? Hey, Bobo, do flowers have best friends? I'm sorry. I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, follow me. I want to show you something. Look, flowers do have best friends. Whoa. Some answers can only be found in nature. Discover the unsearchable. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a trail near you. Brought to you by the United States Forest Service and the Ad Council.